Good news! There are dietary steps that you can take to prevent cancer. And in today's Thin Thinking podcast, my guest, oncological nurse practitioner and weight loss coach, Mary Welch, will give us the skinny on how to help prevent cancer by the way you eat and will also reinforce how weight management is a powerful step towards cancer prevention so stay tuned. Did you know that our struggle with weight doesn't start with the food on your plate or get fixed in the gym? 80% of our weight struggle is mental. That's right. The key to unlocking long-term weight release and management begins in your mind. Hi there, I'm Rita Black. I'm a clinical hypnotherapist, weight loss expert, best-selling author, and the creator of the Shift Weight Mastery Process. And not only have I helped thousands of people over the past 20 years achieve long-term weight mastery, I am also a former weight struggler, carb addict, and binge eater. And after two decades of failed diets and fad weight loss programs, I lost 40 pounds with the help of hypnosis. Not only did I release all that weight, I have kept it off for 25 years. Enter the Thin Thinking Podcast where you too will learn how to remove the mental roadblocks that keep you struggling. I'll give you the thin thinking tools, skills, and insights to help you develop the mindset you need, not only to achieve your ideal weight, but to stay there long term and live your best life. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm excited to share today's episode with you. I met my guest, Mary Welch, when she had invited me to participate in her Winning with Weight Loss series back a couple of years ago. And I was excited to find out that she was an oncological nurse practitioner. Um, Ovarian and uterine cancer run in my family as well as breast cancer. And, uh, you know, so I have always, always been very sensitive and uh, both my mother and my grandmother passed from um, ovarian uterine cancers. And so I've been always very proactive in trying to eat a diet that's healthy and preventative. Um, And so this subject is near and dear to my heart. Um, My, it's so in It's a great honor to introduce my guest, Mary, to the Thin Thinking Podcast. Mary is an oncological nurse practitioner who released 80 pounds using a whole food anti-inflammatory diet combined with intermittent fasting. She was inspired to lose weight after learning that her elevated BMI quadrupled her risk of uterine cancer, the very cancer that she treats in her practice. She is now helping clients achieve their weight loss goals through her six-month coaching program, and she enjoys sharing the message with cancer survivors that weight loss will decrease inflammation and may help reduce the return of cancer and prolong survival. Mary lives in Seal Beach, California with her husband and son. So excited to welcome you, Mary. Hey, everyone. So now I have Mary Welsh here in the flesh, and I'm so excited to talk to her. I have so many things to ask her because I find uh, the top, well, we've, there's just so much. We, we've got, I want to talk to her about our 80 pound weight release and how she made that happen, but we also want to talk about cancer prevention and how, like, if you are a cancer survivor, how losing weight is going to make an impact with you. And, and Mary is really just so, uh, is such an expert at this. So welcome, Mary. Um, it's so great to have you on. Thank you for having me, Rita. I'm really just so honored to be here. And thank you for, you know, giving me a chance to get the word out about the link between obesity and cancer. I think it's such an important message. Oh, well, it's my honor. And I have to tell everybody, so I met Mary uh, with her own series, the Winning at Weight Loss series, which is a phenomenal series. So if you haven't checked it out, can they check it out online at any time? Is it hosted somewhere, or was it, it just a, it was just a series, right? It was a series, but um, you'll be doing another one. I'll be doing another one, yeah. <laughs> and you'll be hearing about it. Yes. Okay, so you are an oncolog- oncological nurse practitioner. And I have a feeling some people know what that is, but I have a feeling some people don't. So can you tell us what you do? 
Oh, sure. So I, my population currently is the GYN oncology population. So I deal specifically with female cancers below the belt or below the breast. So it excludes breast cancer. Okay. However, um, much of my career, I did deal with breast cancer as well. So mainly I help women as they go through surgery and chemotherapy and radiation for ovarian cancer, cervical cancer, vaginal cancer, endometrial or uterine cancer. Those are the main ones. Um, so I meet them from the time they're diagnosed. And many times they stay with me and on treatment or often on treatment until either they're cured or until their disease progresses and they end up on hospice and at end of life. So it's, it's a pretty comprehensive you know, wow. relationship where you get to know patients. Well. Yeah. And, and at what point did you kind of have your aha moment with your own link to concerns about cancer? Uh, because at one point you were 80 pounds heavier than you are now. Yeah, it was very eye-opening for me. Honestly, I have been a yo-yo dieter most of my life. I mean, I can remember trying to lose weight in high school to qualify for a ROTC scholarship because they wanted you to be a certain weight. And oh, so I was working oh. for that. And then you have to weigh in and remember sitting in the sauna so I would lose enough weight to be able to <laughs> like, make the weight. So I don't think I was really obese, but you know, I wasn't petite, let's put it that way. And then over the years, I would gain some weight, lose some weight, and always with um, using different types of gimmicks that weren't sustainable. It was a very low calorie diet or a liquid protein shake type of diet where right. I could lose a lot of weight in 12 weeks or 18 weeks. And then once that ended, I went back to my old ways of eating and surprisingly gained the weight back. So at the time, um, when I really hit my all-time high, it was a period of time with a lot of stress. I was dealing with my um, mom who had dementia, and I didn't realize it at the time, but emotional eating was a big component. So I was eating and, you know, not dealing with the loss and grief of, you know, a mom that's there but not there. And right. I, I would see her at the memory care facility and then on the way home I'd be going through a Wiener Schnitzel drive through getting a chili cheese dog and a, it had a tasty freeze attached with like an ice cream cone so it was like total <laughs> comfort food but yeah so I got up to 236 pounds for me on 5'7 that makes me a BMI of 36 at that point and I was not comfortable or happy at all um, I knew it wasn't healthy for me I had lost weight before about 55 or 60 pounds in 2014 but had gained it all back by 2016 so I felt very hopeless in a way that it wasn't possible for me and I started thinking about just embracing my oversized body and you know just buying big clothes that fit and you know look good at any size because uh -oh. they do put that out there but then I just deep down knew that it wasn't very healthy. And thank goodness I went to this oncology lecture. It was I can remember September 2018. And the speaker was doing a talk about obesity and cancer. And Ann Katz is her name. So I was listening to this and I was like, how come I did not know this? And she was rattling off statistics that 13 different cancer rates that were increased in incidence because of obesity. One of them was endometrial cancer, one that I take care of. Wow. And that risk quadrupled with the elevated BMI. So I said, wow, that's really shocking. And then the next thing she said really gave me some hope. She said, that's a modifiable risk factor. I'm like, modifiable risk factor. So that means that it's something you can change. So we do have some risk factors we can't change. You know, sometimes it's age, sometimes it's your gender, sometimes it's your ethnicity, or maybe you have a genetic predisposition. Right. But things like smoking, that's a risk factor that you can stop smoking and lower your risk for lung cancer. So I never smoked because I knew I didn't want lung cancer. So suddenly the switch flipped in my head that I don't want to keep eating and being obese if that's going to quadruple the risk for endometrial cancer. Would it, can um, I interrupt and ask you, did, does that increase the risk factor for breast cancer as well? Yes. 
Yeah. The top three, you know, ones that are impacted by weight are breast cancer, esophageal cancer, and endometrial cancer. Interesting. You know, it's it is interesting. This is a subject close to my heart because my mother was obese, and so was my grandmother, and both of them passed from ovarian or ovarian type cancers. My mother had uterine cancer that then progressed into peritoneum cancer, and anyway, I know we've discussed this, but. Um, did uh, I am curious, Mary, why you, as a nurse practitioner, is that just not common knowledge passed about in the medical community that the, the risk factors from uh, increased BMI and cancer, like those t- female cancers? Mm-hmm. I think it's starting to increase awareness, but actually they did a poll, one of the um, American Society of Clinical Oncology just polled the population to see what they understood. And less than 50% of people could identify excess weight as a risk factor. Um, You know, people were able, like 70 or 75% recognize the sun as a risk factor for skin cancer. They recognize smoking very well as a risk factor for lung cancer. But Weight seems to be acceptable, and um, I think we need to do a better job about educating people that having that extra weight, which, you know, I was thinking, well, maybe it's not so big a deal, but in fact, it it isn't just um, vanity. Mm -hmm. um, It can impact things. And one of the things, you know, then I started getting curious as to why does having this extra weight make cancer risk higher Mm -hmm. and as I started looking at the information that's out there that is a metabolically active organ it doesn't just Mm -hmm. hang there like a muffin top and actually it really explains why once you get heavy it's hard to lose weight or it's harder to break the cycle because the fat is signaling things. So it's pre, pre producing hormones. One of them right. can increase estrogen. So that's why estrogen driven cancers like breast cancer and endometrial cancer can be at higher rates because the more fat you have, the higher estrogen levels you have. And that's just right. going to drive the cancer. Many breast cancers are estrogen receptor positive. Mm-hmm. One of the treatments would be to put someone on an estrogen blocking medicine to right. shut that pathway down. So if you have excess fat, you have extra estrogen that's sending signals. It also produces growth factors like insulin like growth factors that cause cells to grow, divide, and multiply. Well, the problem with cancer is that you have cell growth that's abnormal and out of control. So if you have more growth factors that are being produced in the fat, you're going to have more opportunity for cancer cells to grow. Right. And then you may outgrow your blood supply and um, then the inner part of the cells, they um, atrophy or die off and then the cells the macrophages part of your immune system are trying to clean up the dead cells and that causes inflammation so the inflammation can trigger more problems so as you have more fat you're more inflamed you have more hormones you have more growth factor coming around so unless you break that cycle it's really tough to get out of it right wow so um what for you, like how did you start your weight journey then? I know you said you started researching and eating more anti an anti-inflammatory diet. Can you tell mm-hmm. us a little bit about that? Sure. I you know have always been interested in weight loss. I mean, <laughs> it's a pastime. I could tell you, I always thought I shouldn't have this problem because I, I, I know a lot, but it wasn't being applied. But a Isn't couple it, of books. Can I just say it's so curious because a lot of of uh, we weight strugglers weight you know like weight loss is a hobby it Mm -hmm. is a even though you know like I always joke and say people who struggle with weight often could write their own book on Mm -hmm. weight loss because very informed Mm -hmm. but anyway go ahead yeah and and I think that goes to show like I always said I didn't have a knowledge deficit I had a doing deficit so (laughs) very um, good I like that Mary (laughs) and um That's why I think your work is so important. And honestly, you know, I knew there was something with my brain and mindset and changing my thoughts. And 
that was part of it that really helped me this time. But some of the books that I had read before I even heard this lecture, it started making sense. One was The Plant Paradox by Dr. Stephen Gundry. And he oh, talks yes. about interesting how certain foods can cause inflammation. His story himself was pretty interesting. He was a cardiothoracic surgeon who ran marathons, yet carried around 70 to 80 extra pounds. Mm. And he had this gentleman come into his office who had really clogged arteries and he wanted to do a four vessel bypass. And the guy was like, doc, I don't want to have surgery, please, you know, give me a chance. And I, I'm going to change my ways. So he's all fine. You have three or four months. So the guy left and came back and had lost a bunch of weight. And when he repeated his tests, the arteries were wide open and he's all, what have you done? So this guy said, you know, I eliminated gluten, I eliminated lectin, I went on this anti-inflammatory diet. So then Dr. Gundry's like, interesting, I'm going to try it. So he started trying this diet himself, and he eliminated things like bread, inflammatory, things like certain seeds and plants can cause inflammation. So tomatoes, although they're very good, the seeds or the skin could be inflammatory. Oh, right. um, certain nuts like peanuts and cashews and even um, soybeans can be inflammatory. So certain things I was eating, I was snacking on cashews, I was snacking on um, peanuts, and he would just have little shifts. Like instead of having that, you can have... Um, walnuts and pecans and pistachios and macadamia nuts and avoid inflammatory oils and I'm like who knew there was inflammatory oils so it's mm. oils like olive oil or avocado oil are very good but things like canola oil are very inflammatory so wow. um, and just shifting so anyway he started doing this and he finally was able to lose this 70 pounds that he had so now he has two practices one I believe is in Palm Springs and the other is in Santa Barbara and he has story after story of people that are reversing a lot of these autoimmune or inflammatory type diseases based just on diet so as you read his book he talks about people that have improved their Crohn's disease people that have improved migraine headaches people who have taken care of skin conditions simply by changing their diet and getting food out of there that um causes yeah. inflammation one of them would be sugar which was my huge downfall you know i probably gained my 80 pounds just by eating all the goodies here at a um medical office There's isn't always- it crazy how at medical offices like i i do work with so many nurses doctors people mm-hmm. you know they're like oh you don't know what's in our staff room it's doctors have the worst diets in the world you know mm-hmm. Yeah, it's true. And, you know, grateful patients, there's always somebody getting their last chemo and they're grateful. So they bring in oh, bagels, that would be the healthier option. Or they have donuts or Porto's pastries or C's candy at the holidays. Yeah, it's an unlimited carb fest if you work at office. <laughs> Yours. Yeah, so it's interesting, too. I had a I had breast cancer uh, client who said that they had donuts available for the chemo patients. And I just thought that that, because I knew about, at that point, my mom had passed from a cancer and I had gotten very, very interested in the connection between diet and cancer and having, and and I had, you know, my weight journey started for, you know, to lose weight, but, you know, I've kept off a number of pounds for, you know, 25 years. And I will say that, in the last decade or since my mom passed, definitely my weight management has also been cancer management. Like, you know, I do see the way I eat as prevention, disease prevention. Yeah. And you're right. As I became more aware and look at the snacks and things we have for patients, it's Lorna Dune cookies, Oreo cookies, graham crackers, apple juice, everything's kind of sugary. Um, Even these top, you know, cup of noodle soups. I mean, there's nothing very healthy here for patients. I'm like, bring your own food. Yeah. (laughs) We don't want what we have for you here. And so when you, you changed your diet and so, and then, and you also, where did you start um, uh, doing more the, um, 
Oh, I'm now having a brain no, blip, the, but you know, the, the intermittent um, fasting, the intermittent yeah, fasting. Sure. So that's another book that I had read before I even started. So you know, I had done, so I read the Dr. Gundry book and I thought that's interesting, the plant paradox. I didn't even know about inflammatory food. Then I um, found Dr. Jason Fung and he has a book called The Obesity Code. And it's F-U-N-G. That's a really interesting read. It's kind of science-y. Um, but before I was doing oncology, I worked in a diabetic treatment unit. So I was, you know, I'm interested in diabetes. And there's been a lot of advances as far as medications go over the years, too. Well, he talked about being able to reverse diabetes. And I thought, wait a minute. I always thought of diabetes, especially type 2 diabetes, as a chronic disease. Once people have it... They just go on different medicines and you have to increase them and increase them. Eventually they end up on insulin and it's a lifelong thing. And, you know, they have the late effects of diabetes, which could be poor circulation that leads to blindness, kidney problems, dialysis, amputations, losing toes, that sort of thing. So when he said you could reverse it, I'm like, how? And he's all, well, part of the reason people are diabetic is because they have what's called insulin resistance. So... And that's often triggered by extra weight and eating too much sugar. So your body is protecting itself. Your brain and your body only want a certain amount of sugar circulating. So as you eat sugar, your pancreas is going to make some more insulin to bring that blood sugar down. At some point, you may not respond as well to insulin, so your pancreas has to secrete more of it. So the more insulin you have... um, As he described this, insulin is a storage hormone. So it's storing the sugar and converting it to fat. So if your insulin levels are high, you're in fat storage mode, which means you're not in fat burning mode. So even if you have a body full of fat like I did, you can't tap into it for energy because you're not burning fat, you're storing fat. And that's why people that have a bunch of weight, if you're eating carbs like I was, you can have a donut or bagel at eight o'clock and by 10 o'clock you're hungry again because your blood sugar went down and now it's like gosh I need to eat and it would be this constant need for food the three o'clock dip where you need another snack and um yeah so what he found is that if you actually stopped eating and you weren't giving your body food you stopped secreting insulin and as your insulin levels were down you could actually start burning some of that stored fuel or stored fat on your body for energy. So I thought, interesting, I have plenty of fuel. I don't (laughs) need to eat all the time. This is convenient. And I just started trying it. And it wasn't like you have to go days without eating. It was like, you know, don't eat breakfast. I'm like, what? We're told breakfast is the most important meal of the day. So, well, you know, I'm not always hungry at breakfast. Maybe I'll just have some black coffee and drink some water and see when I get hungry. I'm like, wow, I made it to lunch and I'm not even hungry. So then, you know, I would have my first meal around lunchtime and then have dinner at home. So you could eat from maybe 12 to 6, 12 to 7. And then the rest of the time, right there, you've done a 17 or 18 hour fast and it's pretty easy. Did you find that fasting, because I think fasting, you know, because I, I work with the brain, right? And the, I mean, the, the using language is so powerful. So this idea of not eating after dinner versus fasting after dinner, I think it's a lot easier that idea of fasting because it's much more active and you're actually doing something like you are in your mind, you're, like you said, decreasing the insulin that's circulating in your body. There's a, like a, an activity to that versus not eating, which is very linked to deprivation. So I think that idea that you're doing something powerful, right? Yeah, yeah. there's definitely ways to think about it. One for sure is, wow, if I eat, I'm going to secrete insulin and I'm going to go from fat burning to fat storing. Well, I want to burn fat, so I don't want that snack right now. So yeah. that's one. The other is that digestion for our bodies takes a tremendous amount of energy. So as we're digesting food, we're not doing other things. So if you actually give your digestive tract a rest, your body can focus on other areas. So um, I've found some benefit for fasting to even lowering um, 
some dementia risk possibly because then your body has chances to go after the plaques and tangles that develop in dementia. Um, when you do fasting, there's a thing called autophagy. Which I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, which is kind of eating self, which sounds weird. But, you know, basically, even with cancer, you have an abnormal collection of extra cells. And if your body is busy digesting all the time, it's not doing housekeeping, working on getting rid of the extra skin tags or extra things that you don't need. But when you're fasting, it can do that. And it might even hunt around and say, well, we can use this as fuel. So we're going to use this. And um so there are some benefits. It's And the thing is, it doesn't have to feel stressful. I remember thinking, oh, I'm on this fasting window. But you know what? If you get very hungry, you can just eat and drink your right. fast earlier that day. <laughs> so it's like. Right. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. fantastic. So your weight release journey, how long did it take you to release 80 pounds? Yeah. So initially, I would say the first 60 came off pretty fast within the first um really six months it felt like and it, it made such a huge difference but then again my diet wasn't great so as I got rid of all the processed carbs and sugary treats and shifted to more vegetables and healthy protein it was just I think a lot of it may have been some water weight initially too um, right, sure but um you know, you could definitely tell the inflammation went way down. Um, before I started, I had um, some abnormal kidney blood work and um, joint pain. And as I changed my way of eating, my kidney function went back to normal. The aches and pains in my ankles and joints went away. And, um, you know, for every pound of weight you carry, it's about a four-pound impact on your knees and ankles. So, um I but did I, not know that. That's amazing. Yeah. And, you know, I went on a hike this past weekend. We were in Utah, and it was like a pretty uphill to this waterfall. And I thought to myself, you know, I don't think I would be able to do this if I still was carrying around 80 more pounds. And right. I felt very grateful that you know, I was able to get it off. And I'm almost at the three year mark now. And I, really feel that it's staying off this time because it's just a way of life and a lifestyle. Right. That's amazing. Yeah. I can tell that you've really made this part of who you are, not something that you're just doing. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit. So you now work with women who are women and men or primarily women who have come out of cancer and help them lose weight so that they can keep their cancer themselves cancer free for the most part tell us a little bit about sure. your with other yes people. so mostly i have um female clients and um honestly i've done um workshops here at my cancer center just educating the um, cancer survivors about nutrition and obesity and cancer um links and you know, it's just very fun to do. Um, but as far as my clients, some are cancer survivors and some are just people that know me that are like, wait, how did you lose this weight? Will you help me? So right. um, that's a lot of fun. Um, and people are having great results. Um, so basically, I um, you know, find out what they've been doing and then look to see how they can tweak stuff. Um, some people don't have tons of weight to lose, but they might be stuck and it could be that they just need to modify their diet a little bit or, um, you know, get the inflammation down. Believe it or not, some people can over-exercise and have inflammation from too much exercise or cortisol levels and mm. just cutting down on that can help. Um, and just real basic stuff, making sure they're drinking water, making sure they're getting enough sleep, making sure um, they're eating good quality foods. I think there's a lot of weight loss food out there that's not very good for you. Um, right. You know, when I was doing Weight Watchers, there was a lot of two-point food, one-point food. But when you look at the ingredients, there's a lot of fake food. So I think right. trying to go for real food that isn't super processed so 
keeping it simple. It's, you know, lots of vegetables. I think if you can load up with a bunch of vegetables, healthy lean proteins that are um, raised well, so kind of grass-fed, hormone-free, happy cows and happy chickens and organic type of stuff without a lot of pesticides because our toxins... um, you know, we can, we're all exposed to toxins through our environment and breathing the air. So if you can lower your toxic load based on making better choices with your food and cookware and other things, um, yeah, it can help as well and lower inflammation. Right. Well, if somebody wants to work with you, um, how would they go about doing that? I know I'm going to post, um, well, those of you who are interested, I am going to post Mary's information in the show notes. Um, I, and would it be like they would have a conversation with you or is there, they can go to the website and read about you? Sure. Yeah, I'm working on a website, so I don't have one just yet. Oh, okay, but, cool. um, but they can call but, you or but they can call me and honestly, email you. I, yeah, there's you could um, email me and then have a link to my calendar and hop on a call and yeah, you know, we'll see where you're at, you know, where you are, where you want to go, and if I think I can help you. Um, the people I do work with tend to be one-on-one um, support, but then we also have a small group of, on Facebook and then group coaching about twice a month, which I think is pretty powerful because there's some good sharing from other people that are on the journey that. They may find I products that work. And, yeah. yeah. And just, you know, you're not alone and there's this little degree of accountability. So, um, so yeah, I would love to talk to anybody. Um, no strings attached, even if you just want to talk and get a couple of ideas. Um, what know, would you say um, just is the, you know, in your journey to Weight Mastery, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Um mm-hmm. it, was there something else you wanted to say about? Oh, no, no, no. I just like, as we're like finishing up, I just wanted to ask you like on your journey of weight mastery, I know you, you had to focus on weight release in the beginning. And what was, you know, what would you say the one thing was for you mindset wise, Mm -hmm. that was the most powerful for you in the beginning? Well, I think the biggest thing for me on this journey was actually working with the coach. And I feel like fate just made me run into this gal, Laura Frontiero, who's actually a nurse practitioner. And I had done a five-day challenge that was free, but I liked everything she said. So I got on a free phone call with her. And after I talked to her, I knew that I had to work with her. So we connected every two weeks, and I think having that support and accountability was very crucial for me because in the past, I would start something and then stop. And I yeah. knew when I'm like, wait, I'm supposed to have these goals, and I need to report back in two weeks to let her know how it's going. I better like go to the yoga four times like I said I would. And um, Right. You know, and it's surprising. As a people pleaser, I was... <laughs> more worried about being a good student and like making my coach happy than if I was trying to do it on my own. So, and then I think she also broke stuff down. I, I think if you try to do everything at once, it's overwhelming, but mm-hmm. she was able to pace me and guide me. Like I, I think one of the first things was looking for hidden sugars in your pantry. And I was surprised um, salad dressing you think you're having a healthy salad and if you look at the ingredients oh, yeah. sugar right there in the salad dressing or sugar in your barbecue sauce and little things like that it's like okay well I, I can make my own salad dressing or I, I can change it up so I'm just not dumping sugar on my vegetables um, right yeah so there were helpful tips that yeah. just layered on and if I felt stuck and there was a time where the scale didn't move for about a month and I remember feeling so frustrated and her tip was don't weigh yourself put the scale away just keep sticking with it and you know in the past I would have gotten mad and probably started eating (laughs) but of (laughs) course the scale's not going to move so um so I think having that support really helped and yes um I think that ha- having support, support of a group, um, and you know, in, in my uh, in my the, my belief system and my with the shift, we talk about cultivating your own inner coach too, so yeah. that your conversations with yourself up level as you 
progress. Mm-hmm. And I'm, it sounds like you have a very powerful inner coach, Mary. Yeah. And I feel like I've developed that by listening to podcasts. So I'm so glad you have a podcast. Um, <laughs> you probably won't know how many people are impacted by it, but... Um, yeah, I'm I'm glad and I love having a podcast too because I get to talk with people like you about powerful subjects. I mean, I think this has been really I mean, there is so much you could get dive into with regards mm-hmm. to cancer and weight management and health and um I'm no we just we just touched the tip of the iceberg, but it's been it's great that you have not only your nurse uh, practitioner background in oncology, but that you've gone on that journey yourself. I think that makes mm-hmm. you a powerful leader in this area, which is super exciting. And I'm looking forward to, you know, having you on again and, and diving deeper into the subject. And definitely, if you are interested in cancer prevention or weight loss, uh, if what Mary said made sense to you please get in touch with her she's uh, she really is a, such a powerful person and incredibly caring and these summits she puts together if you get a chance to come and listen to her winning at weight loss series she gets really great people too you're really the, you really do you you what is it you fight the fight and you walk the walk Right. And those summits are so fun to do, be, just like you with the podcast. I mean, I feel like I get to curate and talk to the people that I want to talk to. Yes. And, um, you know, there's so much out there and there's new stuff all the time and hearing from people that are willing to share their knowledge. And even if there's just one or two tips that you can take away, it's very, very valuable. Right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and um, good luck with all that you're up to. I know you're up to a lot and thanks again for making a difference with people. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks so much, Rita. This was a lot of fun. Bye, everybody. Bye. Okay. And that wraps up another episode of the Thin Thinking Podcast. Make sure to check out Mary's information in the show notes to learn more about the way that she helps people with weight and health management with her coaching program. And as always, it's wonderful spending this time with you. Have a healthy and vibrant week. And remember that the key and probably the only key to unlocking the door of the weight struggle is inside you. So keep listening and find it. And thank you for being here. I will see you next week. If you want to dive deeper into the mindset of long-term weight release, head on over to www shiftweightmastery.com. That's www.shiftweightmastery.com, where you'll find numerous tools and resources to help you unlock your mind for permanent weight release, tips, strategies, and more. And be sure to check the show notes to learn more about my book, From Fat to Thin Thinking, Unlock Your Mind for Permanent Weight Loss.